Welcome to our stanza two devotion on the hymn, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It. Now, today I'm not physically standing at the baptismal font that I'm going to talk to you about. I said we're going to talk about different locations that you might find a baptismal font in our churches, but I'm going to put the picture right here on the screen. And it's, it's a picture of the baptismal font in the Chapel of the Christ at our Martin Luther College in New Ulm, Minnesota. And this baptismal font is, is a little bit different. It's bigger. Um, it is placed at the entrance into the sanctuary. Um, so as you leave the narthex or the gathering area, you walk right by that baptismal font on your way into worship. And it's said that um, baptismal fonts were placed in a location like that um, to signify our entrance into our Christian life is in baptism. It also helps to remind worshipers as they walk by it of the, the baptismal grace God has given them that when they hear the, the forgiveness of sins proclaimed, they can have confidence that it is theirs because of that covenant God made in baptism, that he has made us his children and that he has taken away our sins. So that picture, um, it's, it's a really high resolution picture. It's actually off a, a web page from MLC where you can put that as like your desktop background. So I'll put a link to that uh, underneath in the description as well if you'd like to see some more pictures from the campus that can be desktop backgrounds, phone backgrounds, and so forth. But our stanza today, we're going to look at stanza two and I'm going to start out by reading, you, uh, reading to you from Genesis chapter 3 verse 8. And it says, They heard the voice of the Lord God who was walking around in the garden during the cooler part of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And you know, you know the story. Adam and Eve have sinned against God. They've, they've eaten the fruit from the tree they were not supposed to. And so sin disturbs them. Sin has disturbed their perfect relationship with God, their relationship with the rest of his creation. It's, it's disturbed their relationship with, with each other as husband and wife. And we look and, and we see how this happened and, and we could ask ourselves, what, what sin disturbs us? What, what sin disturbs you? Um, what thing you thought or said or did you know, yesterday or even, even this morning? Or maybe it's the, the thing that, that was years ago, decades ago, and all of a sudden it, it pops into your mind and you're just frustrated with yourself and you say, I can't believe I did that. Now yesterday we focused in on our new status. That as God's own child, I can have confidence that my sins are forgiven, that God has delivered me from death and the devil, and that he gives me new life um, and he gives me salvation. It says, for all who believe this. So why does sin disturb us? Why do we get that, that feeling of guilt and dread or that, that knot in our stomach when we realize that we've, we've sinned against someone and, and against God? Because Jesus has defeated sin, death, and the devil. And, but, but yet sin tries to hold on with that, with that guilt and it, it tries to drive a wedge between God's children and our Savior. So here's what we sing. Sin disturbed my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. I have comfort even stronger. Jesus cleansing sacrifice. And I'm going to hold up that that illustration for you from the book we've been looking at as well. And this is from that that book, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It. And you can see here, Sin disturbed my soul no longer. It shows um, that that boy that was baptized yesterday in that first page. He's growing up, but he's, he's not been... Always so nice to his friends. He's being disciplined by his dad. But then we get to the next page and he's, he's at his bed. He's praying and it says, I have comfort even stronger. Jesus cleansing sacrifice. Now what that's telling us is, or it's showing is, is a depiction of what he can go to the Lord. He can confess his sins and he can have confidence that because of Jesus' sacrifice for us, his sins are forgiven as God's own child. Um, and, and it speaks there of, of that cleansing sacrifice of Jesus' blood. Now, it's, it's said that Martin Luther struggled with depression, sometimes very strong depression at different times in his life. And one way the devil would attack was to try and hang that guilt on him. And that was something he really struggled with. And it was said that when those times would come, Martin Luther would simply say um, words that, that we hear echoed in our hymn, I am baptized. It's basically saying those sins have been paid for. 
But when the guilt of past sins weigh us down, we don't, we don't need to cower or run like our first parents did in the Garden of Eden. We can be defiant again. Sin disturb my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. I see my forgiveness in Jesus. I'm going to open up the, the book and turn the page here. I'm going to read the verse as I, as I hold this up. Should a guilty conscience seize me since my baptism did release me, In a dear forgiving flood, sprinkling me with Jesus' blood. Now on the the left-hand side of the paper, you see the law, the the Ten Commandments on that window. Romans 3.20 says, For this reason no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law, for through the law we become aware of sin. The law is God's good and perfect will for us sinners and and. Yet then for us, it shows how we fall short. In fact, the law condemns us. It shows how we are sinners and we can't save ourselves. So on the right here, you have, you have the boy who's now been confirmed and he's with his parents at the communion rail. And he receives the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, a, a means of grace, Christ's true body and blood for the forgiveness of sins and to keep us in that faith to eternal life. In the Old Testament, there were certain sacrifices where the the blood from the sacrificed animal would be sprinkled on the people, and and that was kind of a symbol, right? But, But this is Christ, the ultimate sacrifice. This is the sacrifice we needed for the forgiveness of sins. And so we say, you know, sins from our past don't need to disturb us because we know we've been forgiven in Christ. And what does it also mean? It it means looking ahead as God's people, too. It means we have a desire to keep his law, to to follow his law. And we say, as we make, or as we walk in this Christian life, sin, don't don't disturb us. I, I know, I know what I desire because I know what my God desires as well. I have a special status. I have that special status, and so I know where I can turn to in temptation. I am baptized into Christ. And so when sin tries to separate us from our Lord Jesus Christ, we can remember St. Paul's defiant tone in Romans chapter 8. He said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because we are God's own dear children. May he continue to keep you in that grace. May he give you the, the strength and the joy to say, sin disturb my soul no longer. I am baptized into Christ. Join us tomorrow for stanza three when, when we, we speak defiantly then to, to the devil and his attempts to get us to lead us astray. God's blessings on your day.